This is Anonymous Tokens with public metadata and applications to private contact tracing and it's joint work with Kjaron Silde of NTNU. The motivation for this work comes from a, ve from a very real world uh, situation. Uh, late fall 2020 Norway started to adopt the uh, Google Apple exposure notification system for their contact tracing app. Now Norway has a lot of health registers including one that records every positive COVID-19 test. So in order to upload your exposure keys uh, from the app, the app would contact uh, a government service and you as a user would identify and if that service found a positive test for you, it would return a token that the app could then forward to uh, the bulletin board where all those exposure keys were uploaded to. Well, in the original design, this bulletin board was supposed to be anonymous. And in this setup, we have this token that links uh, your ID from the verification service all the way to the bulletin board which means that some of the assumptions underlying the exposure notification systems aren't fulfilled and we have fewer anonymity guarantees. Now that could possibly be a problem and so we suggested a simple fix. Let's exchange that token for something else so that this link is broken. Well, how should we do that? We needed some sort of blind signature that was re-randomizable and one-time use only. Now, did such a thing exist? Well, it did. Uh, it came from Davidson et al. Uh, from 2018 and it's a system used by Cloudflare called Privacy Pass. With Privacy Pass, you can generate a token uh, by cooperating with a server, and then you r randomize this token at this uh, at this step called unblind in the first diagram. Now, at the later stage, you can then send what you use to generate this token back to another service, or the same service, and they can verify that this is indeed a valid token and grant you access to whatever resource you, you want to use. Privacy policy is meant to uh, protect Cloudflare services against uh, bots, essentially. But we thought, well, we could use it in this setting instead. And so we did. So we built this into <coughs> the uh, so-called Smitte Stop, what is what the contact tracing app is called, architecture. And well, we got it working and it eventually got deployed, but there's something unsatisfactory here. First of all, this model assumes that key generation is done once and for all. But for Smitte Stop, it wasn't important that uh, the tokens should not be valid for too long. You don't want something to get a token in the spring and then be among a lot of people in the fall and then submit the token. That would be a problem. So they wanted to have regular key rotation and the only way we could do that was by generating new keys all the time and distributing them to the app and to those different services. That's a bit cumbersome. We got it working, but it wasn't ideal. Also, the original privacy pass protocol assumed that uh, it was the same service that would issue and verify the tokens. But we had this split between two services. So it felt sort of wrong that this bulletin board 
should have access to the private signing key K. Philosophically speaking, it should suffice to just have a public key in order to verify that this token is valid. So, if we could fix those two pro issues, so if we could get some sort of adding an uh, expiry date to the token and getting public verification, that would be good for us. Now, uh, to cut the story short, uh, we did that. We were not able to get it into Smithstop, but uh, at least we did the science and it came from a very real place. So the first thing we need to do is start with the definition. And this is essentially the definition that uh, privacy pass uh, satisfies. So you have an anonymous token scheme and it has a setup key generation token issuance protocol and a verify algorithm. Uh, now, uh, Clore at our old Clore 20 expanded this definition with a private metadata bit, which allows uh, the issuer and the verifi verifi yeah. verification service to uh, transmit one bit in secrecy between them. So we wanted to build on their already expanded definition so that we had a, m a system that was as generic as possible. So what we added was public metadata which then enters the tokens issuance protocol, the verification protocol and the bit, uh, private bit extraction and also we modified it so that we could have public verifiability, which means adding a verification key uh, at key generation, the token issuance protocol, at, and at the verification protocol. But it's all sort of backwards compatible, which means that in doing something new, we haven't broken uh, anything of the old stuff, which uh, we believe is a good thing. And our contribution here is uh, to add public metadata <coughs> to uh, and also in public metadata in combination with private metadata for designated verifiability. And in addition, we added public metadata to public verifiability. Now, uh, at the same time as we did this, uh, Tiagi et al. TCR21 uh, worked on exactly the same technique uh, and I will return to them afterwards. There is also an older result from 2000 that essentially achieves public verifiability with public metadata but it is a different protocol and has different uh, performance. So we uh, claim a, a green check mark there as well. So here's the basic protocol and it's very similar to privacy pass. The main difference is that instead of using uh, the public key K directly uh, under the user, we update uh, to a sort of key U that has uh, this a hash of this metadata uh, multiplied with the generator on an elliptic curve and then you add the public key. And then you use this U as your public key all the way. Now on the other hand the signer updates his key material in the same way and it all works out very nicely from there. The question is of course to verify that this key transformation is secure and we'll, we'll return to that. We also have a protocol that gives us public verifiability using pairings and it's essentially the same idea and to verify you take the pairing between the token 
and the key and you verify that it all works out. Uh, please see the paper for the details. So is this secure? Well, the first thing we need is this one more unfortunability property. And the intuition here is to say, let the adversary collect up to L tokens uh, with the same private, metadata, me private uh, metadata bit and the same public metadata. And they can uh, collect a lot of tokens with other metadata as well but at most L. If they're able to present L plus one valid tokens, they win. And the proof here, well, we originally had what we thought was a proof, but a proper proof came from Tiagi et al. And their paper will be presented at Eurocrypt this year. Uh, they reached out to us uh, in a very nice way after we posted our paper on ePrint and told us that they were working on the same thing and that there was a nuance that we had overlooked and we're very grateful <coughs> to them for doing that. So we need another property and that has to do with unlinkability or the anonymity of this and the intuition here is that the views from token issuance and token redemption should be independent of each other up to metadata which means that if you first see a lot of uh, issuance uh, transcripts and then you see a redemption transcript you should not be able to connect the redemption transcript with any of the issuance transcripts now of course if you can use metadata then it falls trivially so we need to assume that it's up to the metadata. And the effect of this is that, well, if these services collude, they can't link the users through tokens. And very nice thing here is that the proof of this, due to the way we just transform the key, is essentially exactly the same as the original uh, privacy pass proof. And well, that might sound a bit boring, the, the fun is in the proofs, but on the other hand we believe that this should give extra uh, credibility and trust to what we have done. We haven't essentially changed anything, we have just exploited the opportunities that lie there already. So how do we compare when it comes to performance? Well, assume that you're uh, rotating your key daily for a year and you have up to 2 to the power of n strings of metadata that you want to be able to use. Well, if you want to use uh, privacy pass, you essentially need uh, 257 times 2 to the n public keys to separate these. If you use DIT, which is Meta's or WhatApp uh, statistics gathering system, which is essentially using a sort of privacy pass to ensure that their log data only comes from real human beings, that is reduced to 257 times n plus 2. But we're able to make that constant because the metadata is decided on a per case basis. So obviously it's very important for the user to make sure that the metadata is sufficiently generic otherwise you will leak uh, anonymity from that. But apart from that it should work very well. Also our signature stays constant in contrast to DIT. If you want to add private metadata, uh, we still compare favorably with uh, Kreuter et al. Uh, at least when it comes to the public key, our signature grows a bit. And then finally, if you want to use uh, private metadata, uh, uh, sorry, 
public metadata and public verifiability, we can compare to this uh, Abi and Fujisaki scheme from 96, which I believe our scheme com compares very favorably to. So we get constant sizes and a lot of feature. And we can just look at what happens if you do this for a day, for a full year, and essentially you will see that we save up to 90% compared to what's out there f uh, from before. Uh, I'm specifically thinking of the DIT scheme that is in use today. So I think we could save uh, Meta and WhatsApp quite a bit of data over a year. If you want to see more of this, please go check our full paper on ePrint. We have an open source implementation of privacy pass that was used in Smitterstop. It's on GitHub and I had a couple of very bright students uh, last summer that implemented this protocol in Rust and we have a documentation of that implementation and code. The code has been made uh, open source as well. Please go have a look if you want. Now, what happened after this? Well, Smith to Stop is now essentially shut down. It's no longer in use because Omicron, essentially. But we were able to uh, enter our contribution to a competition run by the Norwegian Data Protection Agency. And we won. So apparently what we did here was the best uh, among built-in privacy solutions in Norway in 2020. And maybe it was a small contribution, maybe it didn't get used a lot, but we were able to introduce a few ideas about what privacy could mean as a cryptographer. What it means in terms of we're not trusting or we shouldn't have to trust this party and we can prove that we don't have to trust this party. That lies in the unlinkability property and we were able to formulate that in a precise way. And we have been fortunate enough to talk about this in several other forums and we're spreading this point of view, this way of thinking of privacy to a large technical community, at least in Norway. So what did we get from this? Well, we got some OK science and we got public awareness of how privacy can be done and that it's not just compliance, but it could really be built in. I hope to see you soon and possibly on Financial Crypto.